This week's case is a continuation of my last video about a man named John David Norman who ran a nationwide trafficking ring and was linked to both David Coral and John Wayne Gacy and who knows who else. So let's get started. Hello everyone, my name is Brandy, and it is time for another true crime case mystery or paranormal story with one or more of my fabulous felines. If you are a returning subscriber, welcome back my feline friends, and a big shout out to my feline fans for helping support this channel. Now I had a merch update last video, but I just wanted to show you that I am wearing my feline festive sweater starring Freddie as the model and I love it because it's really soft so it's one of my favorite things. Link is in the description if you are interested. Now before we get started on this video I just wanted to say that I have a link in the description to the sources I used but one of the main sources used was a documentary called the Clown and the Candyman, and it's on Discovery Plus if you'd like to watch it. It's a three-part documentary going over David Coral, John Wayne Gacy, and David John Norman and how they were linked. So um, it's pretty mind-blowing. Now, again, content warning. This video is about children being hurt and or killed. So again, I'm not going to go into huge detail, but if there's something that is triggering to you, you might want to skip this video. Okay, if you're still here, let's get to it. So John David Norman was born October 13th, 1927 in Oklahoma. There isn't much known about John's early life. In 1943, John moved to Houston with his family at the age of 16. He worked as a radio engineer and planned on going to college like most teenagers. Although it's not known if John developed an attraction for young boys during his teenage years or shortly after, however, John would go on to become one of the most prolific pedophiles in the United States. So John's earliest crimes on record, that is, took place in 1954 when he was 27 years old, and again in 1956 when he was arrested for sexual assault. But there isn't any record if he got convicted or not of these crimes. His first documented conviction was in 1960 when he was 33 years old. So again, he was convicted of sexual assault. In 1963, he was convicted of another sexual assault in California. Now, these first documented convictions and, you know, uh, charges, we know they were on males, but we don't know if they were on young men, like kids or, or, or you know, under 18, or if they were on just, you know, men in general. In any case, he started having a record in his late 20s, early 30s of this going on. So in 1970, he was convicted of sending obscene literature through the mail. And this was kind of his, I guess, first test on what he would end up doing in later in life. He did get a 15 month prison sentence and he served it at the McNeil Island Federal Penitentiary. So John got out of prison in 1971-ish. I think he did serve his full term and you'll see this is probably the only time he served his full term and he moved to Dallas, Texas. Now there, that's when John first started up his trafficking prostitution ring. He called it the Odyssey Foundation. And it was specifically for men to procure young boys, uh, preferably those under 18. The Odyssey Foundation's goal was to attract young boys from, you know, bus stations those that were runaways, those from broken homes, or those known to, um, you know, maybe be attracted to other men. And then they were brought into this foundation and they were trafficked to pedophiles, 
the men that paid for a boy, they were called sponsors. The boys uh, that were trafficked were called fellows. Now, the fellows were photographed uh, and their booklets were made. So a potential sponsor could just pick out a boy uh, like they were ordering off of a menu. It's very disturbing. They would then contact John and John would make the arrangements. Now, these boys would be trafficked to their sponsors across the country. They would stay one to three nights with a sponsor before they were shipped off to the next sponsor. Now, this was a very sophisticated ring for this time. You know, for the early 1970s, they had to get payment they uh, had to determine nights of stay, scheduling. They had to transport the young, the child, uh, you know, across the U.S. And they were doing this all without the use of a computer. Now, keep in mind that this was going on the same year that David Coral from my last video was committing terrible crimes in Houston, Texas. The Odyssey Foundation went for about two years, and in August of 1973, the same month that Dean Coral was shot by his accomplice, Wayne, a tip came in to authorities about John's little foundation. Now, authorities raided John's apartment in Dallas. There they found John sitting with two underage boys at his kitchen table, and they were going over tons of like documentation, notebooks, cards, all this stuff. Now, John kept all of his records on index cards and in notebooks. It was, you know, again, before a computer, so this was his database. The records listed the names and information of many underage boys from age 12 to 20 that were, you know, fellows, and along with their photographs and the booklets that they were in. John also had index cards listing the names of 50,000 to 100,000 clients, sponsors, located in 35 states in the U.S., these index cards on the sponsors listed their address, contact information, and what sort of boys they prefer. Yeah, some of these sponsors were very prominent people. I mean, are we surprised at this point? But there were celebrities, doctors, lawyers, senators, policemen, musicians, all the way down to, you know, the lower class or unemployed men. During the raid, John was arrested and all the documentation, his index cards, his notebooks were seized and sent to the State Department in Texas. The State Department stated later on that they had destroyed the index cards after determining them to be not relevant to any fraud case concerning a passport. Does that have any relevance on a trafficking ring? I mean, I guess it could if they were sending boys out of the U.S., but however, in my opinion, I do not think that the documentation was destroyed, but you'll see what I mean as we continue down the story. Now, in the end, John was charged with possessing marijuana, ooh, conspiracy to commit sodomy and contributing to the delinquency of a juvenile because of the two juveniles that he had with him. Now, he was in jail for a month and then he was released on bail. Now, remind me, this is the early 70s, right? So um, there would end up being no trial for this because John left Texas and he sort of, you know, jumped bail, right? Due to probably some friends in high places, which you will see this as a pattern as well, the Texas just decided just to drop the case and nothing ever happened or they were too lazy to look for John either way. But um, basically after this raid, nothing came about, no trial, no nothing, and it was just dropped. So where John actually went after his bail is he fled to Illinois and he settled right outside of Chicago. 
Now, he then changed his name and went under an alias of the name of Steve Gerwell. Now, he had a lot of aliases around this time. He moved in initially with a known sponsor from his index cards named Charles Railing. Now, the reason he chose Charles to move in with is because Charles had recently procured a 16-year-old boy from John prior to the raid and took the boy to Europe for a vacation. So he figured Charles owed him, apparently. But Charles accepted him in and let him rent a room from him. So during John's stay in Illinois from late August until November of 1973, he would assault 10 teenage boys. So a tip from a neighbor came into the police about John, known as Steve at the time, committing sexual acts on young boys. So apparently the neighbor just saw a lot of young boys going to and fro. And when she talked to one of the boys, the boys had mentioned something happened. So she called the police. So that boy was brought in with his family and interviewed. The boy told the story that John, Steve, asked if he'd like a ride home and the boy accepted his offer. Instead of taking the boy home, John took him to the house and gave him beer and let him watch adult videos. Now, this is a pattern with pedophiles. They allow these boys to watch adult videos with men and women, and then they'll switch the video to just men. So word spread that this guy, Steve, who was John, was offering free beer and uh, adult movies. So the kid told all his friends, right? So several young boys started coming over and that's when John started um, taking advantage of them. One of the boys stated that, you know, they were drinking beer, so their inhibitions are down and they're watching adult movies. They're getting aroused and when John asked to perform oral sex on them, they just kind of go with it. So that's what was happening there. Now, police, of course, were like, uh, no, this is not happening. So um, they went to the house to arrest John. John was actually out of town when the police came knocking. But, you know, Charles the sponsor roommate was more than happy to assist the police and you know because he's such a great guy himself and promised to inform the police when John returned so while the police searched the house they again found index cards notebooks and recipe boxes that included never several names of fellows and sponsors and you know again this filing system that was supposedly destroyed now although I could see him rebuilding his filing system it is his source of money at this point right the guy never had a job but it's amazing how he could have all this information rebuilt in a minimal amount of time we're talking he got raided in August of 1973 they busted him in November again in 1973 in Illinois. So August, September, October, four months, he has this rebuilt by memory. No internet, no dark web, no social media. But, you know, you make your own opinions on this. That's just my opinion. Anyway, John had returned from his trip and was immediately arrested. And he was charged with five counts of indecent liberties with a child and eight counts of contributing to delinquency of a minor by giving them beer and letting them watch adult movies. The index cards and information, again, was turned over to the Chicago police this time. But the cards again, disappeared. No one knew what happened to them. In that documentary that I mentioned, the, the clown and the candy man, the lead investigators that, you know, had this case, they, they, they say on the documentary, they're like, I have no idea where they're at. They're gone. They were just gone. Knowing the people on the index cards, come on, John had some friends in high places, right? So John spent three years in jail waiting for this trial in Chicago. And while in jail, he started a newsletter, you know, from the jail, John created these newsletters, 
using the jail's own printing press, and he was introducing what he called the Delta Project. Now, the project, according to the newsletter and to what he was telling jail staff, was aimed to provide educational, travel, and self-development opportunities for qualified young men of character and integrity. And you can sponsor one of these boys for a fee. Sounds like a great program, but unfortunately, we know it's a front for trafficking. He was doing this from the jail. In the spring of 1976, John was bailed out of jail by an unknown person from California who paid $36,000 to get him out. His trial took place in December of that year, and he was found guilty and sentenced to four years in prison. John began serving his four-year sentence and continued to produce the Delta Project newsletters with outside help with his accomplice, a man named Philip Paskey. Now, Philip was a young boy who was recruited by John and just like David Coral. And uh, so he then just continued to be John's accomplice for many years. So again, this tells me that if they're sending out these newsletters to probably the same people, that means that John's index card filing system had made its way into the hands of his accomplice, Philip, so the newsletters could be sent out. Because again, rebuilding a list like this, especially with John in jail, by May of 1977, there were 5,000 subscribers to the newsletter, and they were grossing $300,000. So in today's money, that's $1.5 million. Okay, so I'm trying to go in chronological order here because there's a lot of things because there's a lot of um, stories that kind of shoot off from this main story. So I will do my best to keep you up to speed, but let's briefly kind of step back a year and talk about an investigation that took place in 1976. So what happened then is by chance, a conveyor belt at the photo print lab had broken down and it had broken down at the right time. When they were clearing the photos off of the conveyor belt, they found several pictures of two men having sex with a pretty young boy. Police were called and an investigation turned out that the two men were Boy Scout leaders of Troop 137 in New Orleans, Louisiana. These two Boy Scout leaders were named Richard Halverson and Raymond Woodall. They had set up Boy Scout Troop 137 as a front for trafficking young boys. They would specifically recruit boys that were runaways or from broken homes and then give the boys gifts such as guitars and even motorcycles to go with these sponsors and, you know, continue to be trafficked and keep their mouth shut, right? So, They, the two Boy Scout leaders, had index files on boys and the file cabinets full of sponsors. Sound familiar? So Raymond Woodall was found in John David Norman's address book as a contact. He wasn't a sponsor. He was a contact, which is different, but probably the same. Let's be real, right? And apparently Woodall and Halverson you know, was in contact with John, saw what he was doing, and they were like, well, we can do it too under this front of a Boy Scout troop. So again, going through the index cards in the filing system, there were very prominent and rich people listed as sponsors. And Woodall would admit that many of their frequent sponsors were politicians and millionaires. So the investigation started opening up a spider web of links that spanned across, again, 34 states. And it was, again, part of this bigger trafficking ring that John David Norman ran. So here's some examples of how far and wide this went. So in Tennessee, they found a boy's home, which a boy's home is like a shelter, uh, that was a front for making child porn and 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 trafficking as well this reverend yeah 
Reverend, that ran the home would show the boys adult films, give them alcohol, and then encourage them to have group sex with each other and then he would film it and then he would sell these videos right the reverend would also allow sponsors to come to the shelter and to spend time with the boys there were more than 270 sponsors the reverend had on file and several names of men who just bought pictures and videos And one man paid $4,000 for one of the videos of, you know, the group of boys together. So that's just how much money somebody was willing to pay for that type of stuff. It's disgusting. Anyway, sorry. I had a little bit of trouble when I was researching this and I had to take breaks because I would get so mad about this. But in case you're not mad enough, these, this, this boys home, this shelter was created using state and county taxpayer dollars. So there was very little startup funds uh, that somebody had to put up because the tax, you know, why wouldn't you want a boy's home, right? But unfortunately, it was created specifically as a front. So this shelter investigation, because now we have the Boy Scout investigation that opened up the shelter investigation, which now opened up another investigations, But the shelter investigation opened up other links to other homes, similar shelters, or other networks for boys. And these would include churches (laughs) in Michigan and even as far as New Jersey. Um, And of course, churches have tax-exempt status. so. So in summary, John's ring created smaller rings and copycats, and it just spider webbed out everywhere. I mean, you can imagine how this just blows up. <sighs> anyway, back to John. Okay, so John was supposed to serve that four-year sentence, right, after the trial, but he was paroled in the fall of 1977, so he only served a year or less. He moved in with his accomplice, Philip, Philip Paskey, the guy who was helping him uh, from the outside distribute those newsletters for the Delta Project. Now, they continued to do the Delta Project. In 1977, however, someone anonymously sent one of the Delta Project newsletters to the Chicago Tribune, and this was still in 1977. So an investigative journalist called the police and asked them if they, you know, they knew about this Delta Project and what it was and what was going on. And they were promptly hung up on. The police hung up on them. (laughs) Now, It turned out later, after some pushing, that the police were already investigating and aware of this Delta project, and they were trying to keep it hush-hush, and that's why they hung up on the journalist. However, using some networking and stuff, the two journalists from the Chicago Tribune convinced authorities to bring them into the investigation, and these journalists actually took place in a lot of the stakeouts that were happening. So during this time... And this is in the documentary as well. One of the journalists talks about her time in these stakeouts, and it's a little disturbing. But one of the journalists stated that by then, you know, it was sort of well known by then that like men liked little girls because that was disturbing enough, right? You know, because that's when the first time you heard the word pedophile and stuff is in the early 70s. But to realize that men were also interested in little boys was actually mind-blowing to everybody and unbelievable. And it's hard for us to imagine because today we know this goes on. But, I mean, you think about something that just blows your mind that you've never heard of before and you're like, this goes on, you know? So, yeah, they were pretty disturbed by it just from the premise alone. She goes on to say that through these stakeouts, they realized you know, firsthand, they were seeing that these men were buying boys. And these people that were doing this were actually people who worked in the industries to help children. And one of them was foster care. She goes on to tell this one story, one of their last stakeouts, where they were in a sleazy motel and they were watching this foster father and the foster father was actually having sex with his young foster son and then he was filming it and then selling the video to the ring 
The police busted into the room and arrested the foster father. The foster father was proven to be part of John David Norman's network, supplying pictures and videos to them. The boy was moved to another state because he was a witness at this point. But unfortunately, uh, not too long after, he was found murdered. Police do believe he was killed by contacts of this ring, so he couldn't testify against his foster father. So we go back to, you know, the previous video with David Coro, where he told his two accomplices that if something happened to him, the ring would come and get them. So now it's not sounding too far-fetched anymore, is it? After two months of, you know, stakeouts and investigation, the Chicago Tribune asked permission to expose the Delta Project and the trafficking ring, and the police allowed them to write up several articles, and it exploded. <laughs> uh, this whole thing did put more laws into place to help protect children from being trafficked. And don't get me wrong, I'm glad these laws are in place, but we know today this still happens. Uh, so laws are never going to stop it. These people just need to execute it. Did I say that out loud? <clears throat> anyway, let's continue. John was being looked for at this point because they knew that he was the point person for this Delta project and everything. But, you know, he was using many aliases and he was moving around. So he was a little hard to find. However, <laughs> John, of course, couldn't help himself. Um, in the June of 1978, he was arrested for having sex with two underage boys and taking illicit pictures of them. When one of the boys was interviewed by police, the boy told them that John was in, he, this boy had been a part of this ring, uh, of the Delta Project ring for a while, and he was even part of the Odyssey Foundation back in the day, and that John had already sold him to a sponsor, and the young boy was just waiting for the plane ticket to be uh, sent to him so he could be on his way. John's apartment was again raided, and they discovered, you know, Index cards, notebooks, you get it. But he had renamed the Delta Project to Creative Corps and MC Publications. He was just trying to hide it because the Delta Project, you know, got outed in the Chicago Tribune. But again, you know, there was 20,000 index cards approximately that they found of fellows and sponsors and all that. And, um, you know, John has friends in high places and... They were using their power not only to protect themselves, but to protect John. Because, you know, if John couldn't continue his projects, how else could they continue to get boys? It's sick, and this shit goes on today. Anyway, off my soapbox, I'm sorry. Just This subject just makes me mad. Um, I also think that no matter how many times John was arrested, one, he didn't do his full sentence. Um once he started the projects and somehow was able to rebuild, which is highly unlikely in my opinion, or I think he was getting back his filing system from somebody each time it was confiscated and then lost. So, so yes, he was arrested in 1978. He was supposed to serve some time and yeah, he find himself free again in the early 1980s when he was paroled again. So this is not somebody bailing him out. He's getting paroled. So, yeah, I think he had some help. Anyway, between October 1983 and May of 1984, John produced an illicit magazine called Handy Andy from where he was living in Pennsylvania at the time. John would exploit at least 20 teenage boys from this area, enticing them with drugs, alcohol, then photographing them in various sexual acts, and then he would put them in the magazine. Again, authorities would get these tips uh, and got, you know, was notified of this magazine. And again, his home was raided in May of 1984. Uh, but he had actually this time knew they were coming and he had actually left his home before they raided it. And he actually went back to Illinois. The cops didn't know he went to Illinois, but that's where he went. He hid out there for a while, but authorities did eventually find him a couple months later and he was arrested in October of 1984. He was bailed out by someone anonymously again for a lot of money. 
in March of 1985, and then he skipped town again. Now, by this time, you know, it's the 80s, right? So now they're tracking people. They're not just letting things go. You know, they're like, nope, he skipped bail. We got to get him. Police eventually found him and arrested him in August of 1987, which was two years later, in Illinois again. He, he liked Illinois. Uh, John Wayne Gacy lived in Illinois. Just saying. Anyway, he actually was not arrested this time for, um, you know, abusing or sexually assaulting young boys. He was caught stealing his roommate's computer. <laughs> he stole his roommate's computer and equipment, and his roommate called the cops on him. Uh, basically, John David Norman was trying to uh, make his filing system digital so it would be easier to keep, I guess. But then he was extradited back to Pennsylvania, and he was sentenced up to three years for the Handy Andy magazine. I say up to because they give a range from 18 months to 36 months. That's what his sentence was. But do you want to guess how much time he served? Well, it was less than 18 months. We know he was out of prison by 1988. Well, how do we know that? Well, he was in Colorado in 1988 where he molested a child. But he ran from Colorado and he hid out in California. Then in California, he was arrested in 1998, so 10 years later, for dis distributing child pornography, but was released from prison by 1999. See the pattern, guys? See the pattern? Okay. So obviously, we know he most likely sexually assaulted and molested boys during his 10-year hiding out in California, but for whatever reason, he wasn't caught until 1998. So during his parole hearing, <laughs> I hate this guys, but during his parole hearing to see if he was going to get uh, released in 1998, which they released him, by the way, just reminding you that John made a comment that he felt he had done no wrong in his entire life because any sexual contact that he's had with what he calls partners, not young boys, it was all consensual. <sighs> Just for the record, all pedophiles say this. They, you know, choose not to tell you, well, I applied them with alcohol, drugs, or, you know, whatever. Children can't consent, you assholes. Even after that comment, they did parole John. However, this time, when he was released, the state declared him a sexually violent predator and he was to be detained indefinitely at the California State Hospital. Woo, finally something, right? Of course, he was eventually released from the state hospital, and it doesn't really say how long he's, I want to say it was a couple years, but he was released from the state hospital, and he was sent to live in Boulevard, California, where he was put under super, super strict conditions. Well, guess what? <laughs> John violated those conditions in February of 2009. Now, if you want to ask me, I think he viola violated those conditions way before then, but again, just wasn't caught. He was caught in February 2009 when he gave a note with his contact information to a 19-year-old grocery bagger at the grocery store. And of course, the bagger knew who he was and was like, oh no. <laughs> now, John would say that he felt this was okay that he wasn't breaking his conditions because the young man was 19 and not underage. Why wasn't he just castrated at this point? I just, oof. <sighs> anyway, it was against the conditions set for his release. So he was ordered back to the state hospital and he finally died in 2011. He was 83 years old. This is the perfect example of someone who won't stop can't stop and children will be hurt if he's not locked up permanently or dead. So ends the life of John David Norman. Tear, not really. Now let's talk about the connections between David Coral, John David Norman, and John Wayne Gacy. If we go back to the August of 1973 when John's apartment was first raided, that raid was actually a result of an anonymous tip right? 
Well, later it was found out that the person who called in this anonymous tip was a young boy, a fellow that was involved in the Odyssey program at the time. The boy was told by John that he would be traveling to Houston to see his next sponsor. David Coro lived in Houston. The boy was scared and didn't want to go to Houston. So he called in the tip to authorities so he didn't have to go. Was the sponsor Dean Coro? Did the boy not know who the sponsor was and he just didn't want to go because he was afraid it was Dean? Did he just have a bad feeling? Did he know about the disappearances in Houston? And that's what scared him. Like, if he was a boy that was in the program for a while, why would he all of a sudden be scared to go to Houston? It isn't certain, but something to think about. Also, in the last video, we talked about a raid in 1975, where 11 of Dean's victims, the boys were found in pictures in this raid. So obviously Dean had to be doing something because like I said in the last video, and I'll repeat it here is, I think it's a very big coincidence that these 11 victims would have their pictures taken by a completely different set of pedos and then end up being killed by Dean um, unless it was all connected somehow. You know, it's it's not out of the realm, but I do find it a stretch being 11. You know, if it was just one or two pictures, okay, fine. You know, it was just kind of those boys were in the pedo's purview because of their home life or whatever. But 11 victims? I just feel it's too much to be a coincidence. But if Dean took those pictures, he turned them in for money, and that would explain where Dean's money was coming from. You can view the old video, and I go into that. But now let's talk about John Wayne Gacy. Now, this one is easy. He admitted right away that he knew John David Norman. Now, I think many of you know who John Wayne Gacy is, also known as Pogo the Clown. Um, but he, on record, has 33 victims that were boys and young men that he killed. I didn't do a video on him, but he is a well-known serial killer also. I, I do want to start doing videos on serial killers and call it like Serial Saturday. But again, my time has kind of, but I hope I can find time to do that because I would love to do that. Anyway, sorry, side note. Anyway, we already know that John David Norman was linked to John Wayne Gacy because he did stay in Illinois a lot. And that's where John Wayne Gacy did the majority of his victims. And also there's another link. So John David Norman had his accomplice, Philip Paskey, right? Now Paskey was implicated in several thefts and murders. And he also... One particular murder that he was uh, implicated in, not actually charged for, but implicated in, was a boy that was murdered in 1977. So that boy that was murdered in 1977 was the boy that John gave a ride to when he first fled to Illinois. And he actually testified in the trial against John to send him to jail. That boy was stabbed six times, but he was able to crawl home where he died in his mother's arms. Police never could prove it. Uh, that's why we say implicated, but he was, he, they couldn't prove it, that they believe that Philip Paskey actually killed this boy and it was a retaliation killing uh, because the boy testified against John. John ordered it. Philip did it. So that's what is believed, but not proven. Now, after Gacy got caught and he was put on death row, he would state that, uh, you know, the Delta Project was doing snuff films with young boys. Now, snuff films, in case you're not aware, are the person is being assaulted throughout the film, which ends up in their homicide. They are killed at the end of the film. Now, and Gacy stated that some of the victims that he was accused of killing, that count of 33, that, you know, he admitted that yeah, he did most of them, but there were a few, two or three, that he actually didn't do. Gacy stated that it was actually John and Philip that were making these snuff films, and they killed the kids, you know, because Gacy said he'd let John and Philip use his house while he was at work and stuff, and Philip actually had a key to his house and everything. Philip actually worked for Gacy's construction company in 1978, and Gacy said his house was being used as a dumping ground since they knew that Gacy was already killing kids and burying bodies under the, you know, crawl space. So they just piggybacked up on that. <laughs> so he's saying out of the 33 victims, he didn't kill every single one of them that 
John and Philip did. Now, should you believe Gacy? Um, I mean, Gacy did state that he knew David Coral, and he did brag that on record he had more killings than David Coral, like it was some weird, sick, and twisted competition. So, no. <laughs> I mean, I think... Honestly, I think Gacy was just trying to get off death row because that that's known, right? He was doing all he could appealing, trying to get off death row. And I, you know, but again, it's, it's just something to think about because it's not out of the realm. You know, Paskey could have dumped a body or two or John. It's, it's, it's plausible. It's plausible. So again, just something to think about. Another link is, you know, Gacy liked playing the handcuff game and with his victims, which was a way to trick the victim into handcuffing themselves. Well, Gacy stated in a jail interview that he learned the handcuff game from Dean Coral. So obviously he knew Dean. And, you know, Gacy took trip to, Ke to Texas for a couple times. So to me, it just seems like, you know, all three of these men were linked they knew each other. They had some part of the ring, maybe some more than others. But um, yeah, they, they were all linked. It, it, the, the evidence is there. It, it's just it's too much to deny at this point. So that is the story. Now to end this video, um, I want to talk about some points of interest that just are interesting. So some of the unidentified victims have been identified throughout the years using DNA and genealogy forensic technology. So today, only one victim is identified from Dean Coral, and there are two from John Wayne Gacy. However, in 2020, one of the identified victims in Gacy's case hit on family DNA using the gene genealogy forensic stuff. So hopefully they can figure out once and for all who that is and give that family closure. Here's my soapbox, guys. Due to the internet, the dark web, this problem has only gotten bigger. And a so-called ring can be built so much faster using technology. Trafficking revenue is in the billions each year. And the main problem is those with money and power seem to make issues go away. We already have heard and we know this today on, you know, occasional people in power being arrested is that a lot of these people are politicians, celebrities, millionaires. Here's what's difficult to understand. Not one person from John's sponsors lists of any of the cards that were confiscated or seen. They were never charged, never prosecuted. Now, the Chicago Tribune had a couple names from a video that they were able to get and reached out to some of these sponsors, but that's the most that these sponsors were ever contacted regarding the ring. What happened to the index cards? Well, according to the documentary, they are long, 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 long gone. Nobody knows where they're at. This has a famili familiarity to it in the Jeffrey Epstein circle and his case. Besides Ghislaine Maxwell, whatever the hell her first name is, it doesn't matter. She's a piece of shit. None of his other accomplices or connections were ever charged or prosecuted either. We see this over and over, and unfortunately, it'll be something that is always going to be here to deal with. And as long as there's people out there willing to pay money for this terrible, horrific thing, it won't ever go away. Humans are going to be humans, and that's why I like cats. <laughs> Okay, guys, I know this was tough. Thank you, those, for stuck through the both of these videos. Education is key, so keep fighting the good fight. Stay safe out there, and I will see you in the next video. Bye, guys.